Hello, everybody. Welcome to History Valley Podcast. Today we are live with um, Professor Robert D. Bergen. Welcome to History Valley, Doctor. Hello. You've worked on the New Living Translation of the. Uh, you, work, you worked with the team that worked on the New Living Translation, and and you were telling me recently about um, that one of the books you worked on with them was the Book of Exodus. That's correct. But you've also um, there's a couple other books I want to discuss today: uh, Biblical Hebrew and Discourse Linguistics, yeah. and your other book, the New American Commentary right. on First and Second Samuel, yes, the New International Version. When you um, when you look at when you look at First and Second Samuel and the NIV version, but you've also worked on the book of Exodus in the New Living Translation version. I guess the way I would phrase my question is, how would you compare like the NIV translation with the New Living Translation? Since, since you worked on, I mean, you didn't officially work on the NIV, but you, but you did write this commentary on First, Second Samuel on the NIV, That's the NIV version of them, but you also worked on the NLT. So how do you feel about both versions when you compare them? <laughs> well, I think both versions pretty well accomplished what they set out to do. Uh, it turns out that the world of Bible translation, like any other di professional discipline, is uh, complex and nuanced. And uh, you, each version has a target that it tries to hit. And uh, those targets can vary according to education level, according to uh, the, tar the listeners, the readers, ability to handle the English language, uh, and also <clears throat> subgroups within the culture. Uh, and so it depends on what group you're trying to hit as to how you're going to translate the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek into the English language. NIV uh, worked for what they called uh, dynamic equivalence. They aimed at, I think, a 12th grade uh, audience at reading level. And uh, they worked for um, not a strict adherence to the dictionary meaning of the Hebrew words, but rather uh, the, an English equivalent of a word or phrase that in some cases might be very different from what the dictionary actually says. The New Living Translation was actually design, uh, designed initially to be a, uh, an upgrade, I guess you would say, of what was known as the Living Bible, a very popular translation uh, in uh, the 1970s, but not one that was done uh, with regular consultation of the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It was basically a spin-off of the King James Version. And it was supposed to be lively, it was supposed to be more informal, and uh, was supposed to capture not any individual word uh, meaning, but sentence and paragraph meanings, and to do so more idiomatically. Uh, again, aiming at a popular audience. And NLT was supposed to create more, more of a scholarly upgrade of that approach. And so, uh, that's not the same as what the NIV was trying to do, but both hit their marks, I think, pretty closely. NIV continues to be and has been since 1979, the number one selling English translation in the world. NLT is typically about fourth uh, on the list. Let's take a look at a couple of examples of these different variations of translation. Yeah. Let's start with Deuteronomy 32, verse 8 to 9, because I know a lot of scholars um, talk about this. Oh, uh, the original one seems to be talking about, um, uh, they often say it seems to imply some sort of uh, um, multiple powers. Okay. Because in the Dead Sea Scrolls, right. it talks about, okay, when the Most High divided the nations, he mm -hmm. split everything up, all the countries, and gave each country to a god. And then mm -hmm. the Lord, or Yahweh, was given Israel as his inheritance. But when we look at the Masoretic text, it 
it seems to equate the two instead or tries to tries to tries to make it look like it's um one specific deity that's what some will say but even in the Masoretic text it still says that yahweh's uh portion is his people and that jacob was his inheritance right and i see that the, the new living translation in the bottom there seems to be very similar to the lxx Septuagint and also to the dead sea scroll uh 4q duj but what do you make of this well, I'm looking at the Hebrew uh, right here for 32a, Deuteronomy 32a. Um, and, Benachad Elyon Goyim, Behit Pardo, Bene Adam, Yetsev Gohulat Amim, Nemispar Bene Yisrael. Well, uh, I'm looking now, let, let me check some of the uh, versions on my little uh, app here see how they've handled it. And so let's go to uh, translation comparison here. And let me see with the NLT, I can read a little bit more easily from my app here. When the Most High assigned lands uh, to the peoples, when he divided up the human race, he established the boundaries of the peoples according to the number in his heavenly court. Okay, yeah, uh, and uh, then what the Hebrew says, uh, it just says according to uh, the number of the people, the sons of Israel. So there's been a, a, a divergence there between the ancient traditions with the Hebrew tradition, as well as then uh, the Septuagint. And let's see, go to the Septuagintal version of it here. Yeah, uh, there it speaks of Kata, Arathman, and Gelon Thau, according to the number of the angels or the messengers of God. Uh, very different, uh, very different from um, what the Hebrew text says. You've suggested that there has uh, occurred a rabbinical revision, basically, to um, line things up, but the, um, with strict monotheism. Uh, in the in the Septuagintal version, it doesn't speak of other gods. It speaks of uh, a angels of God or messengers of God, angelom, the U. And so uh, I don't see any uh, reference there to uh, or affirmation of the existence of actual deities, uh, powers uh, on the same level as, as God. Uh, as you know, angels are understood from a biblical perspective to be created beings with lesser powers than, than the deity. And so um, the uh, NLT's reading of it there, when uh, heavenly court, uh, angels, of, uh, angels of God, well, you know, that's fine. Um, you have a reference in the book of Job uh, to the sons of God uh, there. And uh, certainly you have that in uh, the Torah and Genesis as well in Genesis 6. And so um, none of those are affirmations of deities on the same level as, um, as the, the creator God of the universe, the one that the uh, Israelites worshiped. Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, I was just, uh, I just brought it up because uh, as I'm sure you probably know, there's a lot of scholars that will look at it that way because like, okay, the Masoretic text is a, a, a is modifying the mm -hmm. older trend tradition because they're trying to streamline it because uh, a lot of our scholars will say um, that Judaism started out as polytheistic uh, and that it, it originated from the Canaanite religion and, and that stuff. So that's the reason why I brought that up. Um, yeah. So uh, that, that is one that is one approach to the Old Testament. That is right. Yes. So when you look at this, when you compare these translations here of, of Deuteronomy mm -hmm. 32, verse 8 to 9, mm -hmm. do you think that the the Dead Sea Scroll version would be representing what the original text says or or the Septuagint? Or do you think the, the Masoretic translation is better? Or the NLT? Well, um, you, you may or may not like this answer, but I would say take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, you have, for example, in Sam, you have 4Q Sam A, a, uh, 
K4 of Qumran, uh, t partial text of the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel, that um, has been used to, um, for, to, for the production of translations. It's been compared to the Septuagint. It's been compared to the Masoretic text and frankly doesn't agree 100% with either one of those. And uh, that, what that suggests to me is that in pre-Christian times, there was not just one standard tradition that was universally recognized as the only possible reading of, of many texts. Uh, that in fact, the text that we call the Masoretic text today, uh, Codex, Codex Leningradensis, uh, dates to about 1000 AD. And um, it, it is the polished, finished work of much rabbinical effort over the years. Uh, but, and, and part of that was an attempt to make sure that the theology was consistent, but much of it was uh, more than anything else, just making sure that inferior readings were eliminated so that the, the closest, most accurate uh, to the original uh, text is the one that has been preserved. And um, that procedure had not uh, been finished. You could argue that it hadn't really even been seriously begun in pre-Christian times. And therefore the Qumran text, as well as the Septuagint, which is a derivative of pre-Christian texts as well, um, would reflect some of the earlier unfinished forms of, or some of the variant forms. Which one of those is the correct form is a matter of unending debate. Of course, you have in the New Testament the same thing with the manuscript tradition of uh, the um, pre-medieval and medieval period documents where you have variant readings. And so you have the field of textual criticism that attempts to uh, examine, uh, to, to catalog all of the variant readings and then assign uh, probabilities as to which ones might most accurately reflect the original. So what we have with the Septuagint, Qumran, and the Masoretic text is the closest thing in the Old Testament to the New Testament uh, discipline of textual criticism. And uh, the opinions are about as varied as there are numbers of scholars. Let's take a look at the next one here. Isaiah 714. Yeah. Now Isaiah scroll, uh, the famous Isaiah scroll, yeah. it has the uh, it translates the Hebrew word Alma as young woman, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that she conceived the son, that his name will be Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, in, in, in typical uh, 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 translations of the Old Testament and the mm -hmm. Christian Bibles, it refers right. to him as being born of a virgin, right? And then the JPS Tanakh, which follows the Masoretic text, mm -hmm. defers to the same translation as the Isaiah scroll does, young woman. Um, mm -hmm. But in the Septuagint, mm -hmm. the Septuagint says virgin. Yeah, Parthenos. Yeah, it, it, mm -hmm. uh, right, right. And um, so here, what we have here is not uh, necessarily a Christianization of, of Isaiah 7, 14. It, assuming that the uh, Septuagint copies that we have today have not been corrupted by Christians. Uh, what we have is ultimately a, um, a recognition of the semantic range of the term Alma. The Hebrew term uh, Alma refers to basically a young woman of marriageable age. And in that tradition, uh, certainly it's reflected in the laws of the Torah, virginity was uh, a necessary condition for a woman prior to her entrance into marriage. And so to speak of a young woman of marriageable age was the equivalent of saying a virgin. And it's just a matter of what you want to emphasize out of the range of possible translations of Alma. Uh, what, what, since you're only given one option out of more than one option, uh, which one are you gonna choose? The Septuagintal translators picked uh, virgin, Parthenos, and uh, that tradition has been uh, certainly canonized in the New Testament, uh, and therefore Christian translations will opt for the Septuagintal rendering of Alma. But uh, it is equally 
accurate to say that Alma refers to a young woman of marriageable age, which could have been someone from anywhere from, say, age 7 or 8 to uh, 15, something like that. In Psalm 22, 16, uh, mm -hmm. for dogs all around me, a gang of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Yeah. Uh, that's in the it's a in the Dead Sea Scroll translation of it, and then the uh, so it's basically identical to the uh, to many of the uh, regular uh, Christian translations of the Old Testament. So, so in this case, it seems that Psalms twenty two is closer to that than it is to the Masoretic text, which is a little bit different. Yeah, and, and again, if if we can uh, assume and. Uh, there's no strict documentation of this, but if we can assume that there were variant uh, copies of these uh, of the original texts of some of the, uh, in this case, hymns of uh, the Yahwistic religion, then um, those will be reflected in the variant uh, translations. It depends on where the where the people group was located, that where the group was. Uh, tr scribes were doing their work and what their background was, but they, they might follow a different, in this case, musical tradition, a different uh, set of lyrics. And uh, that's just the reality of, of life in a pre-printing press world. And so variants like that are, are inevitable. And uh, that's, and probably are one of the reasons why the uh, medieval, well, why the Masoretic text that we have today uh, had to be produced. They had to eliminate what are, were deemed to be inferior readings in favor of a different one. And sometimes what these, uh, what both the Septuagint and Qumran have available, as well as Cairo Geniza and other kinds of early traditional texts, early texts, um, have, they're, they're not going to read the same way uh, and, and would not until the Middle Ages. So would you think that, well, what do you think the original reading of Psalms 22 is in your view? <laughs> in your view? Yeah, I, I've never uh, tried to write a paper on that. I, I mm. really haven't done the background on it. Uh, I always consider it to be uh, safe to go with what the rabbis came up with because they spent a whole lot more time in that culture and in that language and in the faith tradition than I have. And they would not purposely uh, do, uh, do violence to their religious traditions in, in what they produce. But they also have a sense of integrity that they're trying to preserve uh, authentic readings from the ancient past. And so I always start with the assumption that I can rely on the Masoretic text. Uh, if I'm dealing with um, a passage where there is a real problem in the Masoretic text, then I'm willing to go to check other sources out. And you certainly have that from time to time in, in the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, you have, for example, an extra paragraph added uh, to one of the chapters uh, in uh, 1 Samuel that uh, is not present in the Masoretic text, but is present in uh, other ancient traditions. And so um, I think we need to give due consideration to that additional material that's found in, uh, in that section sort of thing. So. We're going to take a look at a couple of more slides yeah, in this sure. moment I'll, here. Yes, sir. That's fine. Good. I want to talk about the this because i think this is kind of involved in this discussion in a way maybe not perfectly but i think it is involved the documentary yeah. hypothesis right this is yeah. a you know disputing mosaic authorship so they say that the torah is actually a compilation of a ton of writings lots and lots of traditions that have been That's compressed right. into five books uh that became uh eventually genesis exodus Leviticus, numbers and deuteronomy yes sir what do you make of this uh, in your view? Do you, does, does this make sense to you? Or do you think that well, some, someone like Moses or Moses himself could have 
written a lot of this? Uh, that's, that's an excellent question. I'm glad you raised it. The JEDP theory uh, is the common currency of, uh, of Old Testament scholarship as it existed in the 20th century, especially the first uh, two thirds of the 20th century. And uh, has its origins actually back in the 1700s and even earlier than that. But it, you could argue that it has its origins in the, in the Hebrew text itself. You have uh, different kinds of evidences that have been put forth as, as um, proofs in some cases. I don't consider them proofs, but evidences to uh, indicate that there had to have been multiple authorship and a combination of documents that came together to form what has have been considered in religious circles as a, the, the pr product of one mind of, of one person. And uh, you have on your chart right there a, a capital J and a capital E. Those two uh, letters are actually the first letters uh, in the European transliterations of Hebrew words. Uh, the J is uh, the first letter of Jehovah, which uh, corresponds to the Tetragrammaton, the four letters of the ancient Hebrew title, uh, name, actually the personal name, given name of, of the Lord, the one by which he wanted to be known. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, that's Y-H-W-H in the Hebrew, but because of the, uh, because of the, you could argue Latin, but Germanic tradition, a lot of German scholars were involved in this, uh, it came out as Yehovah, uh, and therefore a J sound, J letter. And um, then you have, and there are many stories, there are many instances in the Old Testament in the Torah where the stories are told uh, and include the personal name of God. And you have other stories where the personal name of God is never used, but the generic t uh, term for deity, Elohim, which in European transliterations uh, has an E as the first letter. Uh, Elohim, God, or gods, if you want to take it that way, but it never, uh, but always is the subject of a singular verb and therefore must be translated as a singular uh, singular entity. So you have uh, the, the J tradition and the, the E, the, you have stories that have the word Yahweh in it, you have stories that do not have the word Yahweh in it, but do have the word Elohim, God, or deity. And as scholars looked at that, they, they asked themselves, why were some stories using the personal name? Why were some not? They looked for characteristics of the stories, and they found that stories that used the personal name of God, interestingly enough, also presented him in a more personal way. Uh, for example, you have in Genesis 2, 4b through 426, the stories of uh, the... Uh, well, Adam in the garden, the creation of Adam, some call it the second creation story. I don't see it that way, but it's a retelling of the story for sure. And um, there you have the term, not just Yahweh, but Yahweh Elohim as uh, the, the, the Yahweh God. And uh, that's often understood to be a J document, even though the word Elohim is equally present. And in that, in that, uh, Yahweh Elohim's series of stories there, which they assigned to the J document, they noticed that Yahweh uh, uh, Yitalech uh, was walking with the uh, with Adam and Eve in the Ruach Hayom in the in the wind of the day, whatever that means, and um, therefore was more personally involved. We have Yahweh basically getting his fingers muddy in the creation of Yahweh Elohim, getting his fingers dirty in the creation of Adam, a much more personal, intimate, involved deity. And that contrasts with what we see in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, which uh, shows, or 2, 4a, whatever, but 2, 3, uh, which has a um, only the use of the term Elohim, Bereshit Elohim, for example, verse 1, where you use the term Elohim. And there you have a God who is seemingly very distant. He doesn't need to uh, step down to planet Earth. He doesn't need to uh, create clay and then mash it all together and then blow in uh, the mouth that he has created of the Adam, of the man. And so you have a God, in fact, who with two words, he or, can create all the electromagnetic energy of the universe. Let there be light. 
that is a very powerful and a very distant God. He, uh, it's a God who has no name at this point, just uh, a reference to his category of existence. He is an Elohim. And so um, he is a God who commands everything, and but seemingly commands from a distance. Uh, he sets the stars in place and gives assigns their duties to them, uh, and the animals in the same way, and the birds and all this sort of thing. And so we have uh, a portrayal in Genesis one of an Elo of Elohim, whereas in Genesis two four b through four twenty six you have Elo Yahweh Elohim, and uh, since both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 refer to the creation of Adam, ultimately, uh, the, the thought was, the, the, the question was raised, why would they have more than one creation story? And second, why did they introduce the personal name of Yahweh beginning in the second story? And um, the, the general European sense uh, in the linguistically ignorant era of the 1700s, pre-linguistics, okay, they didn't understand linguistics and certainly not discourse linguistics, uh, was that, oh, a change in code, a change in the language code equals a change in personality and therefore a change in authorship. And so by misunderstanding that uh, when stories used only a reference to the deity as opposed to the deity plus his personal name, that this must represent two different traditions, two different cultural traditions that somehow were blended together to form the unified uh, Judaism of the post-exilic period. That um, this therefore um, must mean that there was not, not necessarily any Moses involved at all. That in fact, we have just stories that came about from who knows where, uh, perhaps Canaanite tradition uh, that were somehow uh, shaped and reshaped in the campfire stories of the evenings and then ultimately codified into the uh, traditions of um, monotheistic Judaism. And um, once you start doing that, and then, then you start asking yourselves, okay, when did, when did this document come to a period of finality? And how do we assign age, years or ages to them? And that's uh, frankly part of the black arts of Old Testament scholarship. Everybody has their own secret recipe for determining how those things are. And uh, with the introduction of all kinds of priestly uh, materials, the uh, codification of behaviors of uh, clean versus unclean, of uh, animal sacrifices, those kinds of things, uh, the, the belief was that there must be a priest involved in this somewhere. And the priest who uh, was trying to preserve his power, his uh, and the, the priestly traditions, and so um, there was the introduction of priestly materials into this Yahwistic Elohistic tradition, and then at some point, um, really beginning in around 626 BC, you have a, um, a second priestly tradition that was focused on the uh, Jerusalem cult, and this would be the Deuteronomists who came in uh, and were very concerned about preserving Israelite society in the face of the uh, Assyrian and Babylonian threats, and therefore uh, went back to a very uh, strict theology that said, we need the Lord to save us. The only way we can save us, is, he can save us, is for us to be strictly obedient to him and therefore, we must uh, reinforce this concept of strict monotheism and the, and the strict correlation between obedience to Yahweh and his willingness to save us and preserve us and bless us. And so you have the supposed introduction of the Deuteronomistic tradition in around 626 or so BC. And so um, the problem with the JEDP theory uh, is that it doesn't make linguistic sense. It, it does not follow the rules of, uh, of human language as we now know them to, under, uh, to exist uh, in our current state of linguistic knowledge in 2022. Uh, what, what the Germans, especially uh, in the 17 and 1800s, early 1900s proposed was something that was based on their, uh, an, an anti, 
anti-Judaic, anti-Jewish uh, perspective, anti-Semitic perspective uh, that was uh, popularized in the days of Martin Luther. He did not invent it, but it was pop it certainly was popularized and furthered by them. And then was uh, brought to its uh, knee plus ultra in the days of Hitler, who uh, capitalized on general German anti-Semitism to uh, wipe out the Jews as much as possible. But the, the JEDP theory was kind of the scholarly approach, as I understand it, to eliminate uh, to, to denigrate Judaism by saying that one of the holiest men of the, of the sacred tradition of Judaism, Moses, not only never existed, uh, it was, he, was, uh, he was a fraud and a, uh, an invention of fraudsters within the Judaic tradition, which is another way of saying, uh, I hate Jews and therefore I hate their sacred documents. JEDP is uh, a fascinating approach, but it's just linguistically ignorant and bears and smacks of anti-Semitism. There's another one. There's a variation. Uh, there's a variant theory on this. Um, the rival to the documentary hypothesis, the supplementary mm -hmm. hypothesis, mm -hmm. which the diagram seems to indicate it's a bit simpler than yep. the documentary hypothesis it, it doesn't it doesn't really create as many hypothetical texts as the documentary hypothesis does so what do you make of this uh that's a, a derivative of jedp notice they use they, they left out the e the elahist uh the elahist never made sense anyway uh but uh the it assumes that the the production of the sacred scrolls of what we would call the Torah, the Chamesh Hamushin, whatever you want to call it, the, the law of Genesis through Deuteronomy, started in, in the days of the 7th century BC with the Deuteronomistic tradition. At least it was, it reached a peak at that point and um, built a theological framework for the, the Torah that basically says, there is one God and you must obey him to receive blessings and to disobey him is to create trouble and ultimately um, loss of the, of the promised land. And so you have the Deuteronomic tradition, which then uh, fed into the, the Yahwist stories, which uh, would not, there's no way that this could be chronological, which then uh, could, could feed into the uh, priestly stories and again the priests during the Babylonian exile were not able to practice their sacrifices were not able to carry out a lot of the rituals associated with the Jerusalem temple uh, but the Deuteronomistic the theological framework was then uh, enriched with uh, Yahwistic stories the stories of, uh, of God's activity among human beings and then was put together uh, in the Babylonian exile by the priests and uh, maybe even early post-exilic kind of period. And uh, with the theological framework and then the narratives of the Yahwistic tradition and then the priestly content, it all came together uh, with priest, under priestly editorship into what we could call, what this chart here calls the Pentateuch, uh, the Torah. Okay. It, it's again uh, an artful approach that is uh, just as unscientific ultimately and unprovable as any of the others. We have a couple of super chat questions. Let's take a look at one of them. Paul Kickling, thank you for the two pounds. Have you read Robert Alter's Hebrew Bible? Robert Alter is a very uh, recognized and, and scholarly and, and gifted um, writer uh, in, uh, who takes especially the um, Old Testament as narrative art, Old Testament as literature approach. Uh, he is a, a very good, a very good commentator for recognizing the artistic value, the literary and artistic value of the stories of the uh, Old Testament. Uh, I have never read his Bible per se, 
he, if he's, I, I would not be surprised if he has produced his own literary version. If he did, I'm sure it would be high quality and, and, and worth checking, but I've never read it. But I do respect the work of Walter, and I recognize him as one who appreciates the literary value of the, uh, the literary qualities within the narratives of ancient Hebrew. I agree with him. Uh, the Old Testament in the, in the original language is, in fact, in fact, high art. It's very well done narrative. I'll kick wing again. Thank you for the five uh, pounds. There is a conflation of in Genesis, both from the original compilers and translators of God most high of a lower God who earth is his jurisdiction. Uh, he can't. Well, that may be his perspective, but there's no um, there's no scholarly acceptance of that perspective. Uh, you have a lot of people who denigrate the Old Testament and um, and they are looking for ways to find uh, things like this. A careful examination of the text would not lead to the conclusion that that suggests right there. That, that is that there is a conflation of Genesis that puts together a higher God and a lower God into some semi-unified texts. Hmm. I want to return to uh, discussing the book of Exodus because we... Uh, okay. Sure. briefly brought that up in the beginning yeah um, when you worked on the new living translation of the book of mm -hmm. exodus mm -hmm. what do, what do you see in in it that is what you consider to be an improvement based on the uh in, 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 in comparing them it against other rival translations of the book of exodus um that's like saying what is the value uh, what is which is better, a Honda CRV uh, or a Chevy Blazer or something? Pick another four-wheeled vehicle that can travel down the road. Uh, the fact is, Blazers and CRVs have slightly different target markets, but they but they end up doing the same thing. Uh, I think again, the New Living Translation's attempt to try to create a uh, a fun to read, understand it the first time. Uh, don't have too much technical terminology, but do convey something of both the emotional energy and the, the fun of the, the stories um, approach that's grounded in the uh, Hebrew of Exodus. They did a good job in that. NIV, NLT, uh, CSV, ESV, RSV, ASV, uh, Jerusalem Bible, uh, JPS text, take your pick, the JPS Tanakh, whatever, all of those. Um, again, we're trying to do what they were, what, what the translators were paid to do. And I, I don't have a quarrel with any one of them. But they, uh, the readings for any individual verse are likely to reflect the differing purposes of the version. Not, not an attempt to corrupt the meaning of the text, but an attempt to communicate accurately to the target audience. Going back to what you said earlier about the early Christians were aware of different traditions of the Old Testament. They already had different versions of it. So even back in those days, there was no one 100% streamlined text as, okay, this is the same thing across the board. There are, right. um, so let's take a let's take for example the Samaritan Pentateuch, the Dead Sea Scrolls Pentateuch, mm -hmm. and the Septuagint's Pentateuch. Okay, they're very very similar, but they're also different in some cases. Very true. Yes, they are. Would you say that this all goes back to, like even like the Septuagint, even though it was worked on in the third century BCE, in its earliest but, day, but could it have been based on? A Hebrew version of, of virtually the same kind of Old Testament that's hundreds of years earlier, that is different from the one that the Dead Sea Scrolls is sent from. Oh yeah, here again, uh, it it had to have been. I mean, it's very possible. Um, it, it's hard to imagine a world without printing presses. It's hard to imagine a world without mass-produced paper, where you can just buy five hundred sheets for a couple of dollars. Uh, and yet, that was the world of the Old Testament. Uh, the uh, literacy was uh, varied by nation and culture. 
uh, in the Babylonian culture, you have uh, in the Akkadian language hundreds of logographs and syllabographic uh, uh, forms. You you have you have to you have to uh, memorize hundreds of different symbols in order to be able to read a text. And if you've ever looked at a cuneiform tablet yourself, uh, our school has one. Uh, if you've ever looked at these things, they uh, are almost unreadable. The mashes in the t uh, in the clay, you really have to have a well-trained eye. And when you have to discern hundreds of different symbols, the concept of literacy in in ancient Iraq um, was uh, limited to the, the highest and best of scholars in that day. Uh, contrast that with what we have in uh, along the Levant or the eastern seaboard of the Mediterranean Sea. There you have alphabets that have at most 29, uh, 30 characters, whatever. Uh, Ugaritic had approximately 30 characters, close to that. And then you have a Hebrew that had only 22 letters. When you're dealing with a written um, language that has only 22 characters as opposed to hundreds, such as in, uh, in, in Iraq, you have the, the possibility of widespread literacy. And so uh, even in the book of Judges, you have example an, an example of an individual from a a country bumpkin basically living out in, uh, in a small village who was able to write down the names of the leaders of his village. You have literacy going back to a very early time period. And that's, again, part of the genius, frankly, of, of, the, Hebrew, of, of, the, of the Jewish people. They were able to, uh, the Canaanites that preceded them, whoever, uh, the people on the eastern seaboard came up with a language with only, uh, that could be actually written down, transcribed with 22 characters. It's genius. We can't even do that in English. We've got 26. And so uh, you have that, but you still don't have paper and you still don't have printing presses. And so um, when you want to preserve a text, how do you do it? And the answer is you kill an animal uh, locally, at least unless you're going to import stuff from Egypt. Uh, you kill an animal, you prepare the skin as well as you can, and then you write down on that skin what uh, the extended text is that you want to preserve. Of course, if it's just a note to somebody, you, uh, you can just write it down on a piece of broken pottery, uh, which was done all the time. But, um, but for a sacred text, you want to use your best materials and you want to uh, write it down as, as well as you can, as carefully as you can, but the only way you can do that, uh, based on the scriptorium, for example, that you have at Qumran, was you have a, a person who will read a text to a group of writers who will then carefully transcribe what they heard and preserve it on these pieces of fine leather. And uh, that, that approach, uh, or imported uh, papyrus uh, in some cases, but that, that approach invites problems. What if the guy next to you didn't have a good night's sleep and uh, maybe even was still feeling the effects of the wine the night before and uh, missed, missed a word? And then he tries to make up for it, so by adding something that he thought he heard but he didn't really hear. Those kinds of problems occur. So that you have variant traditions, even if you start with one person reading the original text, the Ur text, you have him reading that text, you still have sound waves that hit the ears of people who have emotional issues, who didn't get good nights of sleep, or who just are not very good about transcribing. And so you have traditions, you, you have one reader, let's say 20 writers, and you're going to have probably two or three different uh, texts that are formed, even though they all heard the same original text. When those get distributed to sacred centers throughout ancient Israel, to some of the synagogues, the wealthier synagogues, and then those are in turn copied, you end up inevitably with variant readings. It's just the reality of the human experience in a pre-printing press era. And so once those uh, get passed along over the centuries, they acquire a, an, a sacro, sacrosanct value to them 
oh, this is so old, it must be from God. Uh, it, and this must be God's original wording. No, it's the wording of the guy who didn't get a good night's sleep the night before when he wrote it down. Uh, but it, it did come from God, if you're uh, into the tradition that I am. But it was not c carefully, adequately preserved by fallible human beings. And so then you end up with the Qumran readings, you end up with the Samaritan text readings, you end up with the Septuagintal readings, you end up with the Cairo Geniza readings, and you end up ultimately with the Masoretic text, all of which are subject to variance, variances. Golem one, thank you for the ten dollar super chat. Final question. Um so with all that being said, when would you date the Torah? Well, the Torah um, dates back to uh, early, the earliest era of um, organized Yahwism. I'll put it that way. And uh, again, I'm coming to the text as a traditional Christian. And I see no reason to say that there could not have been a Moses. In fact, I affirm that there would have been a Moses, which would place this then in the second millennium BC for the original text. It's very clear though, an, a, a semi, even a semi-objective reading of the Torah is, uh, makes it very clear that whoever started this sacred tradition, and we'll call him Moses, who, uh, that since the days of Moses, this thing has been touched and retouched. Uh, you have a reference to Dan, uh, the land, the, the region of Dan uh, in, the, in Genesis. Well, the stories of how uh, the, the city of Dan came into existence as an Israelite uh, territory are not told until the, book, until the end of the book of Judges. You have a reference in Genesis to uh, the kings of Israel. Well, there were no kings in Israel in, in the Torah period. That didn't occur till around 1040, 1050 BC, the 11th century BC in the days of Saul, at least for a national king. Uh, and so you have, um, and yet you have mentions of Dan and you have mentions of kings. So what you have is a, an ancient tradition that started with the, uh, the, the essential founder of, of, of Yahwism of, of organized uh, the, the organized religion of Yahwism Moses uh, with the the original writings uh, supplemented by the oral traditions uh, of Moses that were passed along in addition to the sacred texts that were preserved by the tribe of Levi by say, by priests uh, in, in a central holding area there you have the the written traditions you have the oral traditions and then you have the editorial editions that added such things as the words dan and kings and also shaped the final versions of the stories so that they would reflect uh, the uh, exilic exilic period so that in other words this thing was started let's say in the second millennium bc and essentially reached its final literary form in the 6th or 5th century BC. But the, but the sacred traditions would have started back in the days of Moses. There's no reason to say that they couldn't. And in fact, it makes much sense to say that they do. Since some of the, th some of the things that are codified in the 613 laws of the Torah relate to the, um, well, the, the desert period. They, they would not have been things that were actually practiced in the Jerusalem temple period. They're very early kinds of practices. Well, thanks for joining me today. And I thank everybody that super chatted their questions. And I thank everyone else that participated in the live chat discourse. And until then, I will see all of you later. Thanks again, Dr. Bergen. Yes, sir. Uh, it's a pleasure. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching the video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.